Okay, uh, we were gonna talk today about the different types of muscle contraction. Okay, uh, clinically, okay, we divide, or the ones that are important for us are the types of contraction, okay, the types of muscle contraction in which the force, okay, changes or remains stable, or the length of the muscle shortens or, uh, or, the, or the muscle lengthens. Okay, so we divide these contractions into isotonic and isometric. Okay, the isotonic is one in which the tension that the muscle develops remains constant, and it will equal the weight or the load against which the muscle is contracting. Okay, and the muscle, uh, the, the, the length will vary, either shorten or lengthen. Okay, now, these isotonic contractions may be divided into concentric or eccentric. Okay, and that will depend on the relationship between the force, the tension, and the load. Okay, a concentric contraction is one, for example, when we flex the arm at the level of the elbow. Okay, this is uh, when the force that we perform, the tension, okay, is greater than the load, so the muscle shortens. Example, dumbbell, the way up during a biceps curl. And when the force or the tension is less than the opposing force or the load, then the muscle will lengthen. And that is an eccentric contraction. Example, dumbbell, the way down, okay, in the biceps curl. Dumbbell is not, it's misspelling there, okay? And the isometric is when the length of the muscle remains constant, it doesn't vary, okay? Now, the tension will vary, okay? Of course, depending on the, the load, okay? When we hold an object in place, exercises like the invisible chair. There is another type, okay? That we don't study in medicine, but maybe if you study uh, for, for, to become a PTA, physical therapist, or different other types of exercise physiology, that is the isokinetic, isokinetic. But we don't want to include this in the PowerPoint because I don't want to create any noise. Isokinetic is a type of muscle contraction in which the energy remains constant during the whole exercise. Okay, there are changes in the tone and in the length, but the energy developed by the muscle remains constant during the whole movement. Okay, and studies say that this is the type of contraction that is more effective to develop strength for, for recovery of the patients. But of course, that requires a very special equipment that is not available everywhere. Okay, but we are studying only these isotonic and isometric so this was just a comment, okay, for you to know that there are more types, but we, okay, don't study normally them in physiology, okay. In these two, isotonic, isometric, the energy changes, okay. Energy changes depending on the velocity of the contraction. If you do the contraction very slowly, you will need less energy. If you do it very fast, you are going to need more energy. Also, depending on the load, okay, will change. The, the, the amount of energy that we are using. Now here we have a more or less the same concept, okay? But we are adding the velocity of contraction, okay? How fast we perform this work, how fast we contract the muscles, okay? And remember the relationship between force and velocity is what gives us the power of the muscle. Okay, power means how quickly, okay, we apply the force. Okay, here we have the different relationships between tension and load, and we are gonna see what happens with the speed, with the force. Of course, if there is no load, okay, if I, I, if I have to do the abduction of the, of the arm and I have no load in my hands, I will be able to develop the maximum velocity at zero load, I will develop the maximum speed or velocity, okay? Now, 
Let's take a look at what happens in the concentric contractions. Okay, let's say we are lifting a weight, okay, a dumbbell, for example. If I increase the load, of course, I'm going to be able to lift it more slowly. And that is something that many of you have tried many times. It's not the same five pounds at 20 than 50 pounds. As the load increases, the velocity decreases. Of course, for this contraction, as we mentioned before, the tension has to be greater than the load. Now let's take a look at the eccentric contractions. When we are placing that, uh, for example, that dumbbell on the floor, okay, we could drop it, but we don't want to damage the floor. In fact, if they see you doing that at the gym, you may be penalized, okay? Do not drop the weights. Okay, in this case, the tension that the muscle develops has to be below the load, okay? Now, the larger the load, the velocity is gonna be greater. It's not the same to place a one pound dumbbell than placing a 50 pound dumbbell, okay? I can take all the time that I have to deposit one that is uh, not very heavy, but if I have a very heavy weight on my hand, I have to put it fast, okay? When we set an object down, and this is the part, this type of contraction, the lengthening contraction or eccentric contraction is the one that is very hard to explain by the sliding filament theory. Okay, remember we were talking about this, this actin and myosin that grabs, uh, uh, this myosin grabs the actin and pulls it towards the center. Okay, that model is great, explaining the concentric contractions, but nobody has it very clear if it explains the eccentric ones. Now, isometric contractions, remember here we don't have any change in the length of the muscle, so here is zero velocity, okay, when we are holding the object. Also, these uh, isometric contractions will occur when the object is fixed. If I'm trying to push a wall, okay, I can try with all my force, but it's not gonna move, okay? So either holding an object or doing this uh, invisible chair or trying to put something that is very heavy or fixed. There we have a video, okay? There you have more uh, details about this, but with what we have here is perfect, okay? For what we need to know during this physiology course. Now, this is the kind of uh, slides, okay? When I like to make stops, okay? Notice that here, you have a lot of information to make multiple choice questions, okay? In which of the following situations, the velocity is gonna be zero? In the isometric, there you have your A, there you have your B, there you have your C, and we have to create a D that could be something, okay? That may be invented or maybe something related. Okay, or you can ask from, instead of doing A, B, C, D, you can say in isometric contractions or which is the, which of the following is accurate for isometric contractions. Okay, maximum velocity is developed. As load increases, velocity decreases. As load increases, velocity increases or there is zero velocity. So you have your A, your B, your C, and your D. See how questions are made? Okay, I encourage you to start every time you see something like this that tries to summarize all the information, that's the moment to practice and create questions. And you are gonna be surprised how you are gonna find sometimes the same question that you made, you can find it in an exam because we are using the same material. And then what? Well, there are other types of muscle contraction, okay? Um, besides the ones that we saw, the classic ones, uh, for example, there is one that is called reflexive. This is not a voluntary contraction, of course, by reflexes. We are going to be talking later about different types of reflexes that occur in the muscles, okay? Stretch reflex, etc. These produce movement, but they are not voluntary. Then we have the tonic contractions that don't produce movement, okay? The muscles are almost constantly contracted. Think in someone that has a muscle spasm or someone 
that has different types of epileptic seizures when they are in the tonic phase, or someone who has tetanus, okay, with constant contraction of the muscles. And then there is a type of contraction that is actually a contraction, quote unquote, okay, that is called the passive stretch or a passive lengthening of the muscles. Okay, the muscle is not contracting, but it's active. Okay, that's why in physiology, we prefer to call muscle activation instead of saying contraction because, because contraction for us means shortening. Okay, this is called passive lengthening. It's a type of contraction, quote unquote, because here the muscle is lengthening while it is not being stimulated. Okay, there is no stimulus from the nervous system, but it lengthens passively. Okay, this is uh, what explains, okay, for example, the passive muscle tension or muscle tone. Okay, there is a protein that is responsible for this. Okay, that protein is tightening or connecting. Okay, remember this huge protein. Notice tightening starts here in the Z disc and has an attachment there to these thick filaments and they extend towards the M line. They are, they are the ones that hold these myosin filaments and are holding the Z lines together. This is like a spring that keeps the tension or the tone of the muscle. Some people, have a mutation in this protein or some people develop alterations in this protein with time and for example the classical application of this that one day maybe we find a fix for it some people have some cardiovascular conditions okay in which they have a very stiff hard muscle okay and they have a problem with the feeling of the heart they, they develop diastolic heart failure. The, the cardiac muscle is so stiff that doesn't fill with blood, okay, because of this excessive tension produced by mutations or alterations in this molecular spring that is called tightening or connecting. Okay, we are going to see, and this is still under a lot of investigation. There is a lot to know yet. And also, of course, how can we fix this to prevent this from happening? So one thing that we have to talk about is how the muscles develop tension. Okay, this will be different for, uh, for skeletal muscle than it is for cardiac muscle. Something that we are gonna see in more detail later and also during the study of the heart itself. To develop tension, okay, we have to know different concepts to understand how the muscles develop tension. The tension depends on the tension of the individual cells, the individual fibers, and of course, the number of active fibers. Okay, so every fiber is able to develop more or less tension, and then you can recruit more fibers to be added, okay, to produce a higher tension, a higher force. Okay, now the tension of the individual fibers will depend on the number of action potentials that this fiber is receiving, okay? The frequency of the stimulation will depend also on the fiber length, the degree of overlap between the actin and myosin, okay? This fiber length depends on the sarcomere length. Remember a fiber in the skeletal muscle is very long, okay? It's as long as, as the muscle is. Let's say this is the biceps, okay? This is a muscle fiber and the sarcomeres are placed there in series. That's why the length of the fiber depends on the sarcomere length. Will depend on, also on the diameter. Larger fibers are gonna be able to develop more strength because they have more myofibrils. And will depend also on the degree of fatigue in the muscle. Now, the number of active fibers will depend on how many fibers per motor unit are there and the number of active motor units. Okay, these are the two factors here. Okay, so we are gonna see, and we are gonna be covering all these little concepts to see how they apply. Okay, here we have 
for example, the relationship between the length of the fiber and the tension that the muscle can develop. Okay, here we have some examples. When you see this graph, in order to understand it, take a look at this. Here in the y-axis, you see the tension expressed in percent from zero to 100%. And on the x-axis, we have the length okay, of the fiber. Okay, you're gonna see that it's expressed in micrometers from 1.2 to 3.6 micrometers. Notice that towards the left, the fiber is very short, as short as, as it can be. And towards the right, the fiber or the sarcomere is very long, it's totally stretched. Okay, notice that the red line tells you what is the percentage of the tension that the fiber can develop when it contracts. And notice that at both extremes, okay, the tension is gonna be zero. Either if you start with a fiber that is too tight or you start with a fiber that is too stretched, the degree of contraction is gonna be zero, it's impossible. In one case, because the actin and myosin are very, very overlapping, overlapping, and even the one myosin is touching the other Z line, and on the other extreme, the actin and myosin are so separate that they cannot interact. You can put calcium there, okay? Trop troponin and tropomyosin are gonna move away, but myosin heads are not gonna find the actin binding sites. There is an optimal length of the sarcomere, okay, in which the muscle is gonna be able to develop the greatest tension or the greatest or the best contraction. Okay, that is exactly in the center when there is an optimal overlap between actin and myosin. So you don't want it to start very close or very small sarcomere or with a very long sarcomere. Okay, that is the important thing to remember about this. So the application of this could be, for example, when we study the heart, because this also applies for the heart, Okay, if you have a heart that is too stiff or you have a heart that is too dilated, it's going to have difficulties, okay, to produce a good amount of cardiac output. So to pump a very good amount of blood. There is an optimum, optimal relationship between the length and the tension that the muscles can develop. And that is the optimal resting length of the muscle. Okay, that is... Uh, when the sarcomere is about 2.1 to 2.2 micrometers long, as seen here. Okay, and now we have to cover the concepts of motor units. What is a motor unit? A motor unit is, let's take a look at this. This is the spinal cord. This is an alpha motor neuron. also known as lower motor neuron. So one alpha motor neuron with all the fibers that it innervates in the muscle, that is a motor unit, okay? Some motor units have very few fibers. Some motor units have a lot of fibers, okay? And I want you to compare, for example, the movements that we do with the hands or with the tongue, let's say with the fingers, the muscles that move the fingers or the tongue, maybe there is one motor neuron that innervates 10 muscle fibers. Okay, very small muscles that perform delicate, fine movements, delicate, that you need a lot of precision. You have one motor neuron, 10 fibers, five fibers, 100 fibers. Now, if you go, for example, to the quadriceps muscle, you are gonna have a motor a neuron that will innervate maybe 10,000 fibers because it's okay, you are gonna move all of them at one. You don't need to be stimulating them one by one to perform specific types of movements. Okay, so depending on the precision of the movement, hands are used to play piano, Okay, to remove something from the eye, 
to do surgery to suture, so requires precision, play guitar, play piano, okay? That's the difference between the size of the motor units. Small motor units are, are gonna be more precise. Large motor units, okay, are gonna be less precise. You can move all these fibers at one because you're gonna develop more force. Now, take a look at this down here. You see that there we have two motor units, motor unit X, motor unit Y. Notice that this neuron will innervate all the orange or the darker fibers. Let's say these are the type one fibers. And the other neuron, the Y, is innervating the ones that are pale or lighter ones. This is gonna innervate the type two fibers, okay? A motor unit will have a neuron and different number of fibers, but all of them are gonna be of the same type, either type one or type two. So our body, okay, when needs to develop force, let's say we start doing something and we activate only the motor unit X. But we realize that, oh my goodness, it's not enough. It is heavier than I thought. Then we activate the other motor unit that will recruit the fibers number two and I'm able to lift the object. And if necessary, I will recruit more and more and more and more. Okay, the same thing you have here. Somatic axon, motor axon of the alpha motor neuron. You have the neuromuscular junctions. Notice that this axon is innervating only the type one fibers, the darker ones. The pale ones are gonna be innervated by another neuron. That they are gonna be activated maybe later or no, depending on the movements that we need to do. Now, what is the order of the recruitment? Okay, the recruitment of the fibers have a very specific order. Okay, it's a phenomenon that can be observed at the entire level of the muscle. It's a very important mechanism, the most important to increase the tension. And simply we do it by stimulating a greater proportion of individual motor units. Of course, we don't want to perform any anaerobic metabolism if it's not necessary. Okay, we are simply walking, if we are doing a very light exercise, very slowly, okay, we are gonna use only fibers that perform aerobic metabolism. That's why we can resist hours, hours, hours doing, or walking or jogging, maybe if we have good training, okay? So we are gonna see what is the order. Um, first of all, it's important to know that all the skeletal muscles contain all the three types of fibers, one, two A, and two B. Okay, we already said that each motor unit has a single type of fiber, either one or two A or two B. Okay, and we already mentioned this concept that motor units may be divided into small or large. Small motor units have fewer fibers and they are for fine movement and large motor units for developing more tension, okay? Not to perform any type of fine movement, okay? The motor units can be activated, for example, asynchronously. I didn't get that. Could you try? Asynchronously, Siri is interested in this. Uh, let's say you have in a muscle, a, let's say 10 sets of motor units that contain type one fibers. Let's say you have 10 sets of type one. Let's say during the first minute of the exercise, you recruit five of these. Okay, the next five minutes, you recruit the other five and this one go to rest. The next five minutes, you recruit these five and these ones go to rest, but maybe you need to develop more strength and then you're gonna recruit the 10, okay? This prevents fatigue, allows the maintenance of the muscle tone, 
Of course, if we are gonna develop more force, that's not gonna happen. We have to recruit them all, okay? And then if we want to develop even more force, let's say we are jogging and then we start sprinting, okay? Then we need to recruit other type of fibers. Well, while we are jogging or doing aerobic exercise, the fibers that are working are the type one, slow oxidative. Then if we start running faster, we are gonna need to recruit other type of fibers, the 2A, which are the fast oxidative glycolytic. And if we even need to develop more, let's say you are practicing an exercise, you are doing CrossFit, and then you get to a place and you need to lift some weights, then you are gonna need to recruit the fast glycolytic because they're the ones for higher force of short duration. These are recruited in the third place. And that is the order. Okay, you can as asynchronously uh, use different groups of fibers of the same type, depending on the force. Okay, you are gonna use the slow oxidative with high precision and low fatigue, then the type 2A, fast oxidative glycolytic, and at the end, the fast glycolytic fibers. And then we need to enter into how we control the muscle function. Okay, how do we control, how the nervous system controls these fibers? How the nervous system knows, for example, that when I'm gonna contract my biceps, I need to relax the triceps. In mind that you need to lift an object, and when you are lifting the object, you have to, to struggle not only with the object itself, but also with the triceps. So you have to overcome the tension, okay, the weight of the object and also the tension of the triceps. That, that would be too much. Okay, so we consciously may focus on lifting the object and the brain by some reflexes will take care of relaxing our triceps. Okay, the brain has an organization in the circuits, the nervous system, in which sends signals to stimulate the agonistic muscles and the synergistic muscles, and also at the same time, signals to inhibit the antagonistic muscles. Okay, and we are gonna try to understand how it works. There are different sensors in the muscles and in the tendons that are measuring the force, the strength that we develop, and also the stretch of the muscles. Okay, there are a couple of receptors, the muscle spindle and the Golgi tendon are the most important one. This is a muscle, I'm gonna represent here a muscle and the tendon. Okay, the muscle spindles are located here okay, in between the muscles, fi fi muscle fibers that are contracting. And the Golgi tendons, ten tendon organs are located here in the tendons. Okay, this receptor is measuring the degree of stretch of the muscle. Okay, and this here is measuring the force that the muscle is performing. Okay, the objective of these muscle spindles is to prevent excessive stretch and return the muscle to its original position. And the objective of these Golgi tendons is to protect the muscle and the tendon, of course, against rupture, okay? There is a theory that I, I, I read once that says that these Golgi tendon organs Golgi tendon organs give us six seconds to save our life if it's necessary. Okay, and they will allow us, for example, to lift an object that is heavier than the, than the way that our muscles can support, just in case that is necessary to lift that object to save our life or to save someone someone else's life. That means that you might be able to lift a weight that might break your muscles and tendons, but if you don't drop it in six seconds, 
the Golgi tendon organ is going to send a signal to neurons that inhibit the muscle contraction, and you will have to drop the object. Okay, that's something that I heard once. Okay, those of you that have studied exercise physiology maybe know more about this, and I will happily appreciate if you send me some information about that. Now, these organs are sensing the position, the forces, the stretch that the muscle is receiving, the tendons. Okay, they will connect with some interneurons in the spinal cord, in the brain, different levels. Then at the spinal cord level, we have different interneurons that will activate or inhibit agonistic, antagonistic, synergistic muscles. Okay, these allow us to control different movements, stretch reflexes, flexor reflexes that we are going to be trying to understand today. Okay, at the brain level, there are different afferent neurons that will send information to the thalamus, then to the sensory cortex, then to the motor cortex, then to the cerebellum and basal ganglia, and then we'll decide which is the best motor output. Okay, all these things are going to be studied in detail when we go to the nervous system, but simply let's try to see how this is organized now. Here we have a diagram that shows an example of a reflex that is called the stretch reflex, also known as myotatic reflex, reflex. Okay, that works by performing something that we call reciprocal inhibition. Let's see how it works. Let's say we are trying to hold this in place, a plate or any object. So we need to keep the biceps flexed with good tension that is equivalent to the weight of the object. And we need to relax the triceps or the antagonistic in this case. Okay, the information from this muscle and the tension of the muscle, the, the, the tension of the tendons, the stretch of the muscle, etc., is gonna be sent, okay, through afferent fibers, notice in green here, okay, to the spinal cord. Notice that the fiber that stimulates the contraction of the agonist that is here is stimulated directly by the afferent fiber that is receiving the sensory input. There is only one synapsis here, so this is a monosynaptic reflex. Only one synapsis occurs very fast no latency, very fast, hold. Now, the same afferent fiber that comes from this Golgi and tendon, uh, Golgi, Golgi tendon and muscle spindles is gonna stimulate an interneuron that will synapse with another alpha motor neuron, but will inhibit it. So this signal will inhibit the antagonistic so it will relax. Okay, that is how the stretch reflex works. Notice that we have stimulation of the agonist and reciprocal inhibition of the antagonist. Okay, this is one of the simplest reflexes that we have. Very fast. Okay, occurs and it, every time you stretch a muscle, stretch a tendon, patellar tendon reflex, for example, that you assessing your patients. Okay, the same afferent stimulates the antagonist, or sorry, inhibits the antagonist. That's why this is called reciprocal inhibition. Then we have another example here, which is very interesting because how do we control the degree of tension? Okay, we say that this stimulates contraction and this inhibits the antagonist, but how do we control the degree of the tension that we don't go, we, do, we do, don't develop too much tension or too little tension? Well, for this, we have a special interneurons in the spinal cord that are called Renshaw cells. Okay, notice that here we have only a representation of the alpha motor neuron that, as we said, is stimulating the contraction of the biceps. But notice that there is a branch from the same motor neuron that will stimulate an interneuron 
okay? That is inhibitory, okay? There is kind of a cycle of negative feedback there, special inhibitory neurons or interneurons that inhibits the very same motor neuron that caused it to fire. It's, that, it's like the neuron regulating its own activity, okay? It's a negative feedback to produce a stabilization of the rate of firing of this alpha motor neuron, trying to keep everything under control. That's interesting. And then we have a, here, this, this diagram is not in the PowerPoint that I uploaded. Okay, I just found it some minutes ago and I said, oh my goodness, this is so good. Okay, and I added it here. Here we have a representation of the same thing that we saw before. Okay, the stretch reflex, and it has represented the muscle spindle, okay, the excitation of the alpha motor neuron directly, monosynaptic, and the inhibition of the antagonistic, with, that we call reciprocal inhibition. And here we have a, a representation of the action, but in this case we have the Golgi tendon reflex. Okay, notice that here we have a ferent fibers, that in this case come from the tendon. Okay, let's say this muscle is developing excessive force. Excessive force. The tendon is feeling, oh my goodness, if this continues, I'm gonna be broken. I'm gonna be detached from the muscle and I don't want that. In this case, this a ferent fiber from the excessive tendon that the force that the tendon is developing will stimulate an interneuron that will inhibit the agonistic muscle and will stimulate another interneuron that will stimulate the antagonistic. So if I'm developing too much force that will inhibit my biceps and will stimulate my triceps to protect the muscle because it was developing too much force. Okay, so the stretch reflex, remember these uh, muscle spindles, okay, the objective that they have is to return muscle to original length. While the Golgi tendons, the objective that they have is to protect the muscle against excessive tension that may break the muscles, may produce lesions there. Okay, and then there are other reflexes that are more complex. We said that this stretch reflex, for example, is monosynaptic. And there are some uh, interneurons involved. Okay, but notice uh, this type of reflex. This is called the flexor reflex. Notice how many different neurons and even several levels of the spinal cord may be involved in a complex reflex, polysynaptic reflex. Here we have an example of pain receptors in the feet. Let's say we're walking and we step on a piece of glass or a nail. Okay, this is gonna be detected by pain receptors that will send a signal through a ferent neurons. Notice that these signals will end up in several levels, various levels of the spinal cord. Okay, there are excitatory interneurons that will send the signal up. For example, at the level of L4 in the spinal cord, it will stimulate the hamstrings for contraction and knee flexion, we are stepping on a glass. And at L2, it will stimulate the iliopsoas muscle contraction for flexion of the hip, flexion of the knee, flexion of the hip to remove the foot from there. Now, these signals are gonna go up as well. They need to go to the brain, so we go away from there and we call someone if we need help. Now, at the same time that this is happening, 
okay? There is going to be reciprocal inhibition of the antagonistic muscles in the other leg, sorry, in the same leg. Okay, flexion of the hips, uh, the hip and knee, inhibition of the antagonistic muscles in the same leg, as we saw before in the stretch reflex. And there will be a cross extension reflex. Okay, the interneurons are gonna send information to the other side of the spinal cord because we need to stimulate the extensors in the opposite leg so we don't fall. We maintain the balance and the posture. And of course, this information is gonna go to the brain, cerebellum, basal ganglia, motor cortex, so we keep it in place. And you know that this gets more complex, okay? We need sometimes to use one arm to hold something and we need to do several things at the same time. Vision has to be very well, uh, they are coordinating all these things. Okay, so I showed you, for example, how the stretch reflex, the patellar reflex works, very simple monosynaptic. Then how the reciprocal inhibition occurs, how neurons can inhibit themselves to control the degree of firing, and how this can get really complicated when we do uh, or in other type of reflexes like this flexor reflex. And let me ask you if there is any question before moving um, to the next part. And of course, let's have a break before that. So let's go back to our topic today. And we have just a couple of things more to say about the skeletal muscle before we move to the smooth muscle and we move to the cardiac muscle just to see the differences, the most important differences with the skeletal muscle. Okay, what happens when we are training? What are the adaptations of the skeletal muscle to training? Well, we have to mention some, okay, that um, is good to know, okay? We have to, when we tell our patients, we, you need to exercise and do a healthy diet, um, Maybe they think, oh, that's something that I knew. Uh, many people have told me that. I don't need a medical professional to tell me that. But maybe we can develop the skills of explaining things to people in a way that they can really understand the importance of this. Okay? So one thing that happens, for example, is the, uh, there is an increase in the number of enzymes that perform beta oxidation. There is an increased capacity of using fatty acids instead of glucose. And that is great because, for example, this is going to prevent the accumulation of triglycerides in the blood. If the muscles are using triglycerides, of course, we are going to reduce the number of triglycerides in the circulation. Okay, And we are going to remove more triglycerides from the adipose tissue. So the more muscle fiber we have and the more activity and the more enzymes, the, the, the more likely we are to reduce weight, reduce adipose tissue, prevent the accumulation of adipose tissue, and also maintain normal levels of triglycerides in the blood. And that is one very important thing, okay, that you should explain to your patients in the future, okay, of why, okay, exercising is so good, okay, for our health. Then improves the fatty acid transport into the muscle, improves the fatty acid transport within the muscle fiber. For that, we have the actions of carnitine and carnitine, carnitine transferase, which will take the fatty acids into the mitochondria in order to uh, produce ATP from it. And something else is an increased number of capillaries. So there's going to be more capillaries to nourish the skeletal tissue, okay, to provide more blood, to provide more nutrients. Okay, there are more things that we have to say. For example, what are the effects of endurance training? Okay, that was just training. Here we have endurance training. It's an improved ability to obtain ATP from oxidative phosphorylation as with regular training and increase in the number of mitochondria. Remember endurance training, preparing for a running a 5K or some aerobic exercise 
Okay, so we have more mitochondria, more energy processing units. We are going to make less lactic acid per given amount of exercise. Okay, so we are going to reduce, delay the fatigue. We are going to increase the number of myoglobin in our muscles. Remember, myoglobin is this molecule that stores oxygen. Okay, uh, there is going to be an increase in the intramuscular triglycerides, not in the blood inside the muscles. And we are going to have more enzymes to process the triglycerides, increase energy from fat rather than from glucose, lower glycogen depletion. The muscle has glycogen as a reserve, but if the, the muscle is using triglycerides, it's not going to touch the glycogen. Okay, the muscle is going to use fat instead of glycogen. It's going to improve the oxygen extraction from the blood. Remember, training increases the number of capillaries. Okay, so it's going to obtain more oxygen from the blood and a decreased number of the fibers 2B. Okay, and increased number of fibers 2A. Remember, 2B are the ones that perform glycolysis preferentially, and 2A perform glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so those are the most important adaptations, okay, or the effect of endurance training on our muscles. Having said so, we can move to smooth muscle, okay, see what are the differences and the important things that we need to remember. Okay, smooth muscle, and I don't know where I forgot my glasses, but I can use these old ones. Okay, these are different fibers, okay? The smooth muscle fibers are very thin, okay? They have a shape that is described as cigar-shaped or spindle-shaped. They normally have a central nucleus, okay? They don't have this troponin, tropomyosin. Smooth, smooth muscle is different. We're going to see some pictures to illustrate it, okay? The cross-bridge formation in the smooth muscle, instead of being regulated by calcium binding to troponin, as in the skeletal muscle, it is regulated by calcium, but binding to another protein that is called calmodulin. Important difference between smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. Dr. Dayano? Yes? I just yes. want to let you know that you're not sharing your screen. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Oh, I'm wow. so sorry for that. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. I have to, I need a co-pilot here. <laughs> now, thank you so much, thank you. Okay, I was saying that uh, smooth muscle fibers, okay, have some uh, differences that are important to remember, okay, with the skeletal muscle. Okay, one of them is the regulation of the uh, formation of these cross-bridge uh, cycles, okay? There is no troponin, tropomyosin there. We have calcium binding to a protein called calmodulin. In the smooth muscle, there are no neuromuscular junctions. We are going to see later a picture that shows that there are some structures that are called varicosities, okay? That is uh, autonomic nervous system fibers get there and there are that like dilatations of these fibers that are called varicosities okay and the contraction instead of being regulated by actin is regulated by the myosin filament okay remember in the skeletal muscle we have troponin tropomyosin that are covering the actin in this case myosin is the one that regulates the contraction instead of actin the filaments, the thin filaments, are anchored to the plasma membrane. Okay, we don't have there the, the sarcomeres. They are simply anchored to the plasma membrane by some structures that are called dense bodies that are similar to the Z lines of the sarcomere. They have the same type of proteins, but we don't have the sarcomeres. There are no T tubules. These fibers are very small, so they don't need these invaginations. What they have is some small indentations that are called cavioli. Let me try to draw it to see. This is a smooth muscle cell with the nucleus. Okay, what they have is little indentations. 
Okay, that are called cavioli in the sarcolima. They don't have the T tubules, the deep T tubules that the skeletal muscle fiber has. Okay, this is an area with a very high density of calcium channels. Okay, if you remember the skeletal muscle, they have the area, okay, the neuromuscular junction, okay, with a lot of receptors for acetylcholine and they have many calcium, so, so, sodium channels there. And then there, are, there is the T tubule, okay? And then the uh, action potential reaches this area and opens calcium channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In this case, okay, the cavioli have calcium channels there because in the smooth muscle, we need calcium from the extracellular compartment to enter inside the cells. Something that doesn't happen in the skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle fibers don't use calcium from the extracellular compartment, only the calcium that they have in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In a smooth muscle, there are tonic contractions, okay, which allow to maintain a tone, for example, at the level of the sphincters. For example, the lower esophageal sphincter is always closed and only opens when we swallow and then closes again, okay? Or may have phasic contractions or rhythmic contractions. For example, the urinary bladder, the GI tract performing the uh, peristaltic movements, the uterus, etc. So different types of contractions. And some fibers, some cells in the smooth muscle tissue may even be able to generate electrical activity. They have pacemaker activity, okay? Something that doesn't happen in the skeletal muscle. So we are gonna be seeing some uh, examples of these. Uh, here we have a, a classification of the types of smooth muscle. Smooth muscle can be classified into single unit or multi-unit. The difference of this is the single unit smooth muscle they have gap junctions between the cells, so they are electrically coupled, okay? When you stimulate one of these fibers or some of these fibers, the electrical activity is gonna be shared among the whole unit, okay? This exists, for example, in the wall of the hollow organs, okay? It allows steady and coordinated contractions. So we can perform, for example, the motility of the stomach, okay, as a single unit. This doesn't happen in other areas in which there are multi-unit smooth muscles. The multi-unit fibers don't have gap junctions. So each individual cell will contract independently of the other ones. Examples are the uh, large airways, the large arteries, erector pili muscles, and the muscles in the internal cavity of the eye. That means the iris, okay, the different uh, muscles inside the eye. So the external, remember the, ex the external muscles are skeletal muscles. Okay, so the smooth muscles in the eye, of control of the pupil, of the lens, etc. So the contraction of the smooth muscle is different to the contraction of the skeletal muscle. It will depend on extracellular calcium, important difference with the skeletal muscle, the contraction is going to be initiated by, initiated by different mechanisms. For example, in response to stretching, in the case of the blood vessels, if you stretch them, they are going to contract. So they have mechanoreceptors that produce a reflex action to try to keep this always the same tone. They can contract also in response to hormones or neurotransmitters. These are going to bind to calcium channels that are on this cavioli of the membrane. They have calcium channels that are called L-type because they are slow. Okay. When these channels open, calcium will enter inside the cells. And we have calcium from outside. And this calcium is going to bind to some receptors that are in the sarcoplasmic reticulum of the smooth muscle cell. This is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the calcium binding there is gonna release, uh, lead to a release of calcium. 
from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is something that is known as calcium induced calcium release. Okay, it's something that occurs in the smooth muscle. Calcium induced calcium release. Calcium from the extracellular compartment binds to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and induces the release of calcium there. So we have now a lot of calcium inside the smooth muscle cell. Calcium will bind to a protein that is called calmodulin and will activate it. The activated calmodulin will activate a protein that is called myosin light chain kinase. Okay, kinase is an enzyme that induces movement, kinetics. Okay, this activation of this enzyme will phosphorylate, will place a phosphate in a protein that is on myosin. That's why we said before, myosin is the main regulator of the contraction of the smooth muscle. It's not acting like in the case of the skeletal muscle. Now, all of this process is going to lead to an increase in the activity of myosin ATPase. There will be interaction between actin and myosin, and the process is going to be now very similar to the skeletal muscle. Cross bridging, tension is generated. Okay, the more calcium we have inside the cell, the more tension. Notice how different this is to the skeletal muscle. In the skeletal muscle, we said, okay, the tension depends on the number of fibers, the length of the fibers, the degree of interaction between actin and myosin, the size of the fiber, the number of motor units, how many are recruited. Here, calcium is what will determine the tension. It's a lot more simple than in the skeletal muscle, okay? Now, we have to know something about the smooth muscle. Some smooth muscle cells need to be contracted always, okay? Sphincters, for example, anal sphincter, lower esophageal sphincter, and we don't want to waste too much calcium and ATP in performing this, okay? So some smooth muscle cells are able to maintain contraction even without calcium or even without ATP. And it's because they form what we call latch bridges between actin and myosin, so they keep contracted forever, unless we stimulate them with something else, a nitric oxide or a vasoactive inhibitory peptide, other uh, neurotransmitters that we are going to be studying in the future. But there you have these uh, pictures to illustrate what we were saying before. These are the intermediate filaments, actin and myosin. These are the dense bodies, similar, similar to the Z lines. Notice how the contracted cell looks like a stamp instead of looking like a muscle. These are the vesicles or varicosities with the neurotransmitters, very different to the neuromuscular junction. These are from the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic. Okay. Just an illustration of this process so you understand the difference between skeletal and smooth muscle. And this diagram shows all of this complex uh, process okay, of contraction in the smooth muscle. Notice that you have the extracellular calcium entering using these L-type calcium channels. Calcium enters and stimulates the opening of the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium channels. Calcium goes out, and that's what we call calcium-induced calcium release. Calcium binds to calmodulin. Calmodulin activates the myosin light chain kinase. Myosin light chain kinase phosphorylates myosin, Okay, needs ATP for that. And once myosin is phosphorylated, we have exactly the same thing that we saw in a skeletal muscle. Cross bridge, power stroke, and contraction. Okay, then if you need to relax the muscle, okay, you simply need to remove the calcium from there. 
Okay, so calcium has to be taken back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium, calcium has to be taken away from the cells. But in some cases, as I told you, even without calcium and even without ATP, this muscle is able to remain contracted because of the existence of large bridges between actin and myosin, very important to save ATP, to save energy, and to maintain our sphincters closed. Very important, keep the sphincters closed. Video, if you want to see this animated, it's a lot better than simply reading and watching or listening to someone like me talking about this. So this table is very important. Okay, I put this here because I want you to have the information organized. Okay, you can use this table to create questions. Which of the following is true? Which of the following is accurate? Okay, what is the main difference between skeletal or smooth? Okay, which of the following can have, for example, uh, take a look at the different, uh, the things that are important. Okay, for example, here you have the action potential that is needed. In the case of the smooth muscle, many things, hormones, neuro neurotransmitters, mechanical, electrical stimulation, pacemaker, this doesn't exist in, in skeletal. What is the ratio between actin and myosin? Two actin proteins per every myosin. In the case of the smooth, there are 15 filaments of actin per every myosin. Okay, the muscle, the skeletal muscle contracts in a single direction, while the smooth muscle in multiple directions. Okay, the contractions of the skeletal muscle are fast. The relaxation too uses a lot of ATP. Smooth, slow contraction, little ATP use, very energy efficient. If we had to use the same amount of energy, to move our smooth muscles, okay, than the one we use for the skeletal, that would be a problem to make a digestion, okay? We don't feel any muscle fatigue or cramps when doing a normal digestion, okay? And so on, okay, you have there the, notice that I put here in bold, something that is very important. Troponin, tropomyosin is the main regulator, while calcium calmodulin complex is the main regulator okay, of this smooth muscle. In the skeletal muscle, we have more sodium channels. In the smooth muscle, more calcium channels. Calcium, 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 okay? All of these calcium things belong to the smooth muscle. And here we have some take home points, things that uh, it's important to read once in a while, okay, to be sure that we understand the main differences. Okay, why can smooth muscles contract over a wider range of resting lengths than skeletal and cardiac muscle? Okay, because the actin and myosin filaments in a smooth muscle are not as rigidly organized. Remember these 15 to 1? Okay, these Z, uh, these are. Uh, attachments okay then wh where is it i these uh attachments here okay not as rigidly organized okay the dense bodies as the sea lines this is what allows okay to contract in a multiple uh, different uh, range of resting lengths forming these three-dimensional structures what are the differences between single unit and multi unit? Single unit found in the wall of the hollow organs, the stomach, for example. Multi unit in airways, lungs, large arteries, intraocular muscles. Single unit muscles contract synchronously all at the same time. They have gap junctions, they exhibit spontaneous action potential. Multi units lack the gap junctions and they don't contract synchronously. Okay, every fiber may contract when they decide, depending on the situations there. 
please keep in that uh, in your minds that th th that is a very important information okay that is going to be used okay in exams and so on and you need to know of course and the last topic uh, in the muscle is the cardiac muscle you're going to see that the cardiac muscle has some similarities to the skeletal muscle and some similarities with the smooth muscle okay and well the location is simple simply uh, in the heart no we don't have cardiac muscle anywhere else so the location is an important difference okay the cardiac cells have branches okay they are the shape of the smooth muscle is this the skeletal muscle is a cylindrical a fiber very long imagine the fibers of the quadriceps of one of these guys in the uh, basketball players okay these cells are branching fibers okay they have shapes like this okay they are shorter than skeletals have more mitochondria the heart only uses aerobic metabolism preferentially from fat it doesn't resist glycolysis for too long that's why angina develops immediately they have a lot of myoglobin okay and they have these intercalated discs okay that allow the cells to contract in a wave-like pattern as a single unit okay so this heart has this in common okay with the smooth muscle it's like a single unit well actually it's two because the two atria of the heart contract as one there is a fibrous skeleton of connective tissue that isolates the atria from the ventricles and the two ventricles contract also as one. There is a single pathway for the electricity. That is the AV node. Oh, oh, the AV node. Okay, single unit atria, single unit ventricles. Okay, if we have to divide the cardiac myocytes, okay, there are two types. Okay. The work cells, the actual cells that contract, and the pacemaker cells. The work cells have a very large and stable resting membrane potential and a prolonged action potential with a plateau phase. They have a resting membrane potential. The action potential of the cardiac cells has a depolarization and instead of having a repolarization and a hyperpolarization like the skeletal remember the skeletal muscle repolarizes then has the hyperpolarization and then continues well the cardiac muscle cells action potential has a plateau and then depolarizes okay that's a very important difference okay with the action potential of the skeletal muscle fiber we are going to see why. And then the other type of cells are the pacemaker cells, which is something that has in common with the smooth muscle. Remember, smooth muscle cells have also pacemaker capacity. Okay, this occurs in all the cells of the conduction system of the heart, sinoatrial node, AV node, bundle of His, and Purkinje fibers these cells have a smaller resting potential that is actually not resting ever okay it's unstable if you have one of these pacemaker cells and you watch their electrical activity it's gonna be like this it's a waving potential wave wave waves 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 okay these cells spontaneously depolarize generating the intrinsic electrical activity of the heart they are autorhythmic 
once in a while they reach threshold and they produce an action potential. And this action potential is the one that is transmitting, trans transmitted to the work cells. So they contract. Okay. This, for example, will occur in a rhythm that is between 80 to 100 bits per minute. Okay, in the sinoatrial node. And will occur with a rhythm of 40 to 60 bits per minute in the AV node. And will occur at a rhythm of 20 bits per minute in the Purkinje fibers and bundle of his. So every part of this conduction system will have a different rhythm. Okay. And they, of course, they are autonomous. They have autorhythmicity, but they are not the boss of the body. The autonomic nervous system can alter this. So, for example, let's say we are in the AV node, in, uh, in the SA node. SA node is quietly producing waves at 70 bits per minute. Bits per minute. Okay, and then we need to start doing exercises or we get scared because of something. Oh my goodness, there is an exam tomorrow and I didn't know. So the sympathetic nervous system will release epinephrine, not epinephrine, epinephrine on the SA node and this is going to occur faster, maybe 110 times per minute. Or if we are doing meditation, then the, uh, the parasympathetic nervous system will release acetylcholine and that will occur at 50 or 60 times per minute. Okay, that's the way our autonomic nervous system controls that hormones, etc. neurotransmitters will influence there. And medications, we can use medications also to change that. For example, beta blockers. Someone has a very fast heart rate, we use a beta blocker, we block the receptors for epinephrine and doesn't matter how much epinephrine is there, the receptors are not working because we block them. Not all of them, of course, if we block all the receptors, someone may die. Picture to understand the process. Okay, here you have the nucleus of the cells, the branches, you have the gap junctions there, you have the intercalated discs. Notice how the intercalated discs, okay, have a very strong connections between the fibers, desmosomes, which are proteins that link one cell to the other. There you have the sarcomeres, mitochondria. You have the gap junctions here. So if you depolarize the cells, the wave of depolarization is going to enter into the next and into the next, into the next, and you have a coordinated contraction. Okay, and then we can proceed to see a diagram with this action potential of the SA node, which is going to be very similar in the other structures of the conduction system, AV node, etc. Notice that the resting potential, okay, is not actually resting, it's like waving, okay. This uh, potential receives different names, okay? They, in many cases, they call it waving resting potential because they don't know how to call it, okay? Probably one good idea is to call it pre-potential because it's what precedes the action potential, okay? This pre-potential occurs, this going up, occurs because of a slow influx of sodium ions very slow influx of sodium ions until the threshold is reached. And from that point on, there is going to be a rapid depolarization and repolarization until reaching the baseline. And then you have another prepotential reaching threshold and another wave and so on. There is not a stable resting potential it is a waving potential. What explains the prepotential slow sodium influx? What explains the rapid depolarization, 
rapid calcium influx. What explains the repolarization? Potassium going out. Notice that here we have a difference with the normal action potential that we studied. All this was produced by sodium in the skeletal muscle. In the cardiac pacemaker cells, we have a prepotential produced by slow sodium influx and a rapid depolarization produced by calcium. So what would happen if we use calcium channel blockers? Something like this. Okay. It's important to understand this, not just to repeat it in a test, also to predict what will happen when you use medications. Okay. If you block the calcium channels, that will happen, but more slowly. Okay. You can produce a more distance, okay, between the different depolarizations. And here we have the action potential of the work cells, the contractile cells, cardiac contractile cells. Okay. In these cells, we have a resting membrane potential, like in the skeletal muscles. And we are going to have an initial phase that is very similar to the skeletal muscle, rapid depolarization, because of the opening of the voltage-gated ion channels, sodium channels. Then we're going to have a peak with the inactivation of the sodium channels. And what happens at this point in the skeletal muscle? Remember, the skeletal muscle depolarizes quickly because potassium is going out, positive charges moving out. Well, here we have a potassium channel, a potassium moving out as well, positive charges out. But at the same time, we have calcium coming in. Calcium is going in at the same time that potassium is going out. That's why we have this plateau. You have positive charges out and positive charges in at the same time. Potassium in, calcium out, potassium in, calcium out. So you have this plateau, sustained plateau. At the end of the plateau, calcium channels close. And then we have the depolarization, like in the skeletal muscle. It's like a pause between the depolarization and the repolarization. The importance of this is that we have a very long absolute refractory period. Notice the absolute refractory period in the skeletal muscle. The absolute refractory period in the cardiac muscle is like five miles longer than in the skeletal muscle or in the neurons. And what is the importance of that? That we cannot permit by any means summation in the cardiac muscle. In the skeletal muscle, we love to have summation because it is what leads to tetanus and developing force and developing muscle tension. And we cannot allow tetanus in the heart because the circulation would stop. Okay, notice that the action potential in the working cells of the muscles in this diagram lasts almost the same period of time that the contraction lasts. There is almost the same amount of time, okay? Uh, so the twitch in the muscle, cardiac muscle, lasts more or less the same than the absolute refractory period. Of course, sometimes this fails. Sometimes there may be some abnormality and there might be arrhythmias, but that is more for pathophysiology rather than physiology. So the importance of calcium has to be understood, okay? There is an influx, notice the slow calcium influx in the plateau. Okay, there is a influx through slow calcium channels that accounts for this prolonged plateau. Okay, allows the formation of this long refractory period so the cardiac muscle has time to perform perfectly and properly. Okay, calcium ions 
okay, in the cardiac muscle will combine with troponin. And here we are going to have something very similar to the skeletal muscle. The cardiac muscle has sarcomeres. This is striated. Calcium enters, combines with troponin in the troponin tropomyosin complex. Troponin tropomyosin move away, removing the inhibition, and then myosin combined with actin, producing the power stroke. Very similar to the skeletal muscle. Here we don't have to see anything different, but we have to see something important here. Approximately 20% of the calcium that is required for the contraction is supplied by the calcium during the plateau. The remaining 80% of the calcium comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay? That's why we don't have to be too concerned about using calcium channel blockers because we are actually blocking this little percentage out here. The heart is not going to die because most of the calcium comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But of course, this is important. We, we don't block all of these uh, calcium channels either because if we block all of these, we would shorten the plateau and we don't want that. Okay, because then we could have summations and we could have arrhythmias. And we are going to be seeing a, the relationship okay, between this electrical activity of the heart and the cardiac contraction and the electrocardiogram. This is not objective of this lecture. I simply wanted to add this slide here okay, for you to start getting familiar with the EKG. Okay? You don't need to study this now, okay? but you will have to study this when we move to heart. So the earlier you become familiar with this, the better. Okay, here you have the different stages of the cardiac contraction. Okay, this is the start. The heart is relaxed at the end of the diastole. Then we have the activation of the sinoatrial node that we see as a peak on the EKG. Then we have the electricity, okay, depolarizing the atria. Okay, that we are going to see as this segment here, and a delay imposed by the AV node. You see that there is a flat line there? This is the delay. This P is the SA node firing. The delay is this flat line there. And then when the electricity moves down to this bundle of his, we have this peak. Okay, we have the huge waves that we see here. That is the electricity going down the bundle of his and the two branches of this bundle. Okay, this is the depolarization of the septum and the electricity traveling down. Then the electricity depolarizes the ventricles. So we are going to see this flat line here. They are contracting. The blood is moving away. And then we have the repolarization of the ventricles that we see as a T. They are opening to let the blood in. And then everything starts again. Okay, and we are going to see that in the EKG. Not for now, but I like you to become familiar with the terminology and the meaning. Okay, because we are going to be seeing this when we go to heart. And what are the take home points of this part? Important to remember what is the plateau phase. Why is that important? Because it prevents summation, it prevents additional impulses. Okay, to produce another contraction. Okay, we don't need tetanus, remember, in the cardiac muscle, because if it does, it's, it's not going to pump. Okay, if you want to improve, if you want to increase the function of the heart, you don't summate. There are no motor units to summate there. All of them are going to contract as, as one. What you do is you simply increase the heart rate. 
or what you do is simply increase the, uh, the, the feeling, the volume of blood that enters the heart during systole or the strength of contraction. You put more calcium, it's gonna contract stronger. How does the delay of the impulse in the AV node contribute to cardiac function? Remember we talk about this delay. That is extremely important too. We need the atria to contract first completely and put some blood into the ventricles, fill the ventricles very well, okay, before the ventricles contract. Okay, it's like putting all the load, preload in the heart so it can contract properly and pump as much pos uh, blood as possible. What is the importance of the gap junctions, intercalated discs? This allows the impulses to spread synchronously, okay, from one cell to another. So sodium, potassium, calcium flow, okay, at the same time between adjacent cells and this propagates the action potential, ensuring the proper coordinated contraction of the heart. So predicting, let's say this is a heart, this is supposed to contract as a wave, as a single unit. What happens if there is a scar there? Someone had a myocardial infarction one year ago or some time ago. Instead of gap junctions, instead of these intercalated discs, instead of beautiful muscle fibers, you have collagen there. What is going to happen with the electricity? Oh, oh I have no way. I have to take another pathway and this area is not gonna contract, okay? That's what happens in people who had myocardial infarctions. Um, why do cardiac cells demonstrate autorhythmicity? Well, they don't have a true resting potential, as you saw. It is a unstable resting potential, okay? That is a slow influx of sodium through the channels, producing the pre-potential that gradually reaches threshold, and once it reaches threshold, triggers a contraction. And we can make these waves to go faster or more slowly, so increasing or decreasing the heart rate. And that's what we have for today. Okay, the rest of the slides are just some resources that maybe you need just to understand how it works. This is the the part of the cardiac muscle, but it's very similar to, has some similarities with the smooth muscle. Notice that there is extracellular calcium and intracellular calcium. So this is a calcium induced calcium release. In that sense, the cardiac muscle contraction is similar to the smooth muscle, but then the calcium binds to troponin, not to calmodulin as in the smooth muscle. So up to here, Notice how it has titubules like the skeletal, calcium induced calcium release like the smooth. Uh oh, smooth. And then the troponin tropomyosin like the skeletal. Okay, very similar to uh, smooth muscle this part, the skeletal muscle this part. It's like, okay, I like this mechanism for the heart, I like this mechanism for the heart, let me do a hybrid between the skeletal and smooth muscle cells. Okay, so interesting this. And the rest of the things are, there is a video here that maybe you like about the neuromuscular junction. And then you have some photographs that I love. Okay, there you have axons, okay, in different motor. Uh, uh, this is a, a single motor neuron. Notice how it innervates these this but not this or this because these are other type of fibers okay, that's how we know that all this is true okay this is a cardiac muscle notice the nucleus many mitochondria some glycogen there there you have intercalated disc notice how many mitochondria there that is this is glycogen this is mitochondria Oh no, these are lipids, sorry, this is not glycogen, lipids. And junctional complexes. 
and these are the dense bodies in the smooth muscle fibers, the caviolae, caviolae. Okay, these are myofilaments, okay, in the smooth muscle fibers, skeletal, T tubules, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, I put this here because I need you to believe that what I'm saying is true. Okay, that I'm not inventing this. There you have it. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Let me be faithful to my promise. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Do you see her here? Okay, the other one there. This is the one that has attention deficit disorder. This is, and the other one has autism. He's an autistic dog. <laughs> they, are, they are so nice. Yeah. Okay. Any questions that you have? I have a question. Yes. Really quickly. Um, the slide that was added in, I think it was maybe like slide 28, about the stretch and the Golgi tendon reflex. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I can upload this PowerPoint and instead of that one. Um, I wanted to ask, like, it has group A1 or group 1A afferent and in group 1B afferent? That's not important. Okay. That has no application in the clinical practice. Okay. If you remember that this one is group 1A and this one is group 1B, that, that's not going to make a difference when you are going to, when you recognize disease in a patient or so on. Okay. I normally try to, when I create the questions, uh, one thing that I do, okay, and this is important that you know, I started teaching in 2010, okay? Mm -hmm. And when I was creating questions, I used to take, uh, first I, some other professors gave me exams. Oh, you can use my quizzes, you can use my exams. And when I read the question, I said, okay, I've been practicing medicine since uh, I forgot when it was it in 1998 no 1994 and I didn't know this and if I've been able to practice medicine for 20 something years without knowing this why should I maybe I can teach but why should I make an exam to see if they know this if they don't need this to practice medicine Okay, that's something that I do. I uh, become, I, I am very critical with myself and I say, is this really necessary to practice medicine? Of course, there are things that you don't need to practice medicine, but you need to understand something that is important and that you need to practice medicine. In that case, yes. Okay. But details like this, which of the following uh, uh, innervates the Golgi tendon? Group 1A, group 1B, group 1C, group 1D. That's, that's no, 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 not something that I will ask. Besides, I know what happens when you are in a test. You have one minute and you forget everything of, of these tiny details, okay? So no, don't worry about that. For me, what is important is the stretch reflex. The objective is to return the muscle to the normal length. The Golgi tendon reflex is important to protect the muscle so it doesn't break, so the tendon doesn't detach from the muscle or from the bone. That's important for the clinical practice. Okay, and also look at this. The stretch reflex, notice how you have stimulation to the muscle, to the agonistic muscle. Here you have inhibition to the agonistic and a stimulation to the antagonistic, okay? So you simply take the concept, okay, the Golgi tendon reflex protects the muscle against excessive force. How do I protect it? I have to relax the agonist and 
contract the antagonistic. So, oh, I do this. The stretch, if the mass is, if the muscle is too stretched, I have to return it. So I have to contract the agonistic. I am stretching too much my biceps. I have to put it back to normal. So I contract my agonist. Okay. One advantage that we have is that we can practice on ourselves. Okay. We are not studying uh, something in Japan or mm -hmm. we're not studying a, a weird animal that is in a cave or in the, uh, in the bottom of the sea. We're studying not ourselves. So you can try with your muscles. Okay. Stretch or oh, return. Too much force. Oh, I have to relax this and contract this. Okay. And that way you remember better. Okay. But no, no, no. Tiny details. Okay. And in the case of the fibers, oxidative glycolytic. Okay. More than type 1, type 2A, type, type 2B. Okay. More those terms that say something about physiology than a term that is 1A, 1B, 1C. That doesn't tell anything. Okay. Okay. I, I mind that you have a lecture or something. No. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> it's your time. Okay. See you Friday, right? See you Friday at, at 8. No, at 10. At 10, right? No, at 8 a.m. 8 to 10. Okay. Take care. Be safe. Lots of pressure.